Welcome to the Culture Lab. I'm your host, Aga Bayer. This podcast helps you turn your company culture into rocket fuel for meaningful growth. It explores how we can make the word work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. It looks at how we can build remarkable cultures that scale as our businesses grow and the world keeps on changing. When we are seeking change in an organization, we need to be radical in order to make a change. But if we're too radical, we get spat out of the system. So we have to temper. We temper how radical we are. But if we temper it too much, of course, we don't make any difference at all. So productive activism, I suppose, is that very tricky navigation between being too radical or not radical enough. Hey team, welcome to episode 95 of the Culture Lab podcast. This episode is brought to you by Culture Brain, a one of a kind global community for leaders and culture champions who want to learn new ways of cultivating remarkable cultures at scale in this brave new world of remote and hybrid work. The Culture Brain community is where we come together to answer some pretty darn hard ungoogleable questions about culture. And our members get to participate in things like weekly huddles, masterclasses, flash mastermind groups, and talks from world-class experts on culture. And you know many of these experts from this podcast. But most importantly, we facilitate deep peer-to-peer connections. Because making work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging It's definitely not a task for a single person. It requires tapping into the collective wisdom of bold, kind, and curious culture leaders who are on a mission to redefine and, frankly, decrapify work. So if this sounds like something you'd like to be a part of, check it out at tiny.one forward slash culture brain. And don't worry. You don't have to write it down. There is a link in the show notes. Speak up. It's such a common appeal in organizations today. I think especially after the scandals like the Volkswagen or Boeing, when it became abundantly clear that the lack of psychological safety can be deadly, quite literally. And many companies take elaborate measures in this regard. Measures that are aimed at encouraging people to speak truth to power and flag important issues before it's too late, or even just challenge the status quo simply because there might be a better way to do things. But what often happens as a result of all this is a big bunch of nothing. Crickets. I had many conversations with executives and they were deeply frustrated with how their employees just wouldn't speak up, especially about work-related issues. But they did want to talk about social and environmental issues that they cared about. And this is where my guest today, Megan Rates, comes in. Megan is Professor of Leadership and Dialogue at Halt International Business School. She's on Thinkers 50 ranking of global business thinkers and is ranked in HR magazine's most influential thinkers listing. She has written Dialogue in Organizations and Mind Time, and her most recent book is called Speak Up, and it was shortlisted for the CMI Management Book of the Year. Her latest research on employee activism was nominated for the Thinkers 50 Breakthrough Idea Award 2021. Now, in this interview, we talk about creating spaces for dialogue. Megan shares her truth framework that enables employees to speak up. She talks about the advantages of adopting a tempered, radical mindset when driving change, and also about the skills that we need to lean into and lead through the relatively new territory of employee activism. It's such a great conversation. I'm glad you tuned in. I'm Megan. I'm a professor of leadership and dialogue at Holt International Business School. So 
My interest is in how we show up with one another in the workplace. And in particular, how leaders show up and how that affects other people's voices and ideas and behavior. I'm a mother. I have two daughters, one aged 11 and one aged 13. And so they teach me an awful lot about my two big (laughs) research areas, which one of which is dialogue and the other one is mindfulness. And I can tell you they are the best teachers I could possibly hope for. I bet they are. (laughs) <laughs> oh, oh my goodness, that's a whole conversation probably that we could have about that. So I'm really curious how people ended up on the professional path that they are currently. So the first question that I ask all of my guests actually is, what were the early cultural influences that shaped you as a person? I grew up on a farm. My dad was a farmer near London, uh, but we were in the middle of nowhere. And I would say that my childhood was, I was really fortunate. It was safe psychologically. It was full of adventure, curiosity. And my parents and my teachers encouraged me to go to the edge of my comfort zone and uh, take risks. And so I think that was my early childhood and my experience with doing that tended to be positive. So I was pretty fortunate and I recognize how fortunate that was. I mean, it's not so much early childhood, but after university, I went traveling a lot. I remember I went traveling to find myself and figure out what I wanted to do in my life. And so I went traveling for like two years and I came back and I still had no clue what I wanted to do in life. (laughs) I did what I really recommend if you don't know what to do with your life just after university, actually, I I became a strategy consultant. (laughs) And uh, that actually was a really important choice for me. I, I really loved strategy because it was about puzzles. But then, you know what happened? We created these absolutely amazing strategies. And then I started to notice that they weren't necessarily implemented. And I think that's where my interest in culture and people really began. It's like, oh, okay, well, that's the right, in inverted commas, answer. But guess what? That isn't going to work. And that combined with a, oh gosh, tumultuous and rather hilarious time in the internet industry in the 90s, where I joined a rather infamous organization and was put in charge of a very big global team with absolutely zero experience. That was the other thing that happened to me fairly early on that just got me fascinated with people and how people interact in the workplace. And that headed me in the direction and study that I I still find myself in. So eventually you found yourself, or at least you found your passion through these experiences. Still finding it every day. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I know. It's a journey, right? Actually, quite interesting because I had a very similar experience, although I did things the other way around. So I started working in a business as a very young woman, 20 something years old. We actually created a company, found a company with a friend of mine. And I quickly realized that I had no idea what I was doing and uh, I had no idea how to manage our team. And so that was one of the first moments in my life when I realized, oh my gosh, this is really important and I need to learn how to do that. And then I ended up working for a consultancy as well. So, ah, there you go. Yeah. And you quickly really have this realization that indeed people are super important and you cannot execute well on a brilliant strategy if you cannot align culture and strategy. And so that was my way into culture and and this field is so fascinating. And I know, you know, sometimes I refer to culture as collective habits that drive the way we behave. And I know that you've done a lot of wonderful work around what you call conversational habits. Can you share with us what conversational habits are and why they are important to develop? Mm, I'd love to. So you and I and anybody listening right now We have habits around when we speak up and when we stay silent. We have habits about what we find it easy to talk about and what we don't in different contexts. 
we also have habits around who we listen to. You know, when we kind of sit up straight to inattention and we kind of think, oh, I better listen to this person. And we have habits around who we don't listen to so much. Now, those habits around what gets said and who gets heard, they define our lives as individuals. So what you say, what you don't, who you listen to, who you don't, that defines your life. So it defines all sorts of things. It certainly defines your career. If you're a leader, it defines your leadership practice. But those habits are phenomenally important in teams and also organizations. So what gets said and who gets heard defines conduct, ethics, innovation, agility, inclusion, and numerous other things, talent, acquisition, retention. So those habits of conversation have a huge bearing on other things. Interestingly, we're very often not really conscious or aware of those habits, uh, let alone the consequences they have. And so a lot of my work is in shining a light on habits and figuring out how to disrupt the ones that aren't serving us or serving others. This is such an important realization that we're not aware of these habits. I recently had an experience in a, in a social situation where I caught myself paying attention and engaging in conversation with a person who happened to be male and loud and opinionated. And I had to make a conscious choice every minute to engage his wife and their children in the conversation. And so I think you're entirely right that very often we are not aware of these habits because if you asked me if I have a tendency to pay more attention to male speakers who are opinionated, I would say, no, actually, I don't you know, enjoy being surrounded by these people and I don't. But I caught myself in the moment doing that. And so I realized, oh my gosh, where is this conditioning coming from? And even today, why am I still sticking to it? So here's my next question. How are these habits formed? Where do they come from? And what can we do to be more intentional and more mindful and conscious of how they play out in our daily lives and especially at work? Big, big question. In fact, quite a few questions in there. So let me come at that in a slightly roundabout way. The first important thing to say about conversational habits, particularly around speaking up, which is quite a hot topic at the moment. And, you know, how do we change culture? Uh, how do we change culture so that people can speak up more? That's a big, big topic. These habits around speaking up are relational. In other words, they depend on whether anybody is listening. And one of the biggest mistakes I see happening in these various speak up campaigns and initiatives is that they focus just on the individual as if it's a simple matter of changing that individual's habits. But the way that that individual behaves is relational. It's in relation to the system and the individuals that they're encountering at that time. So when we're looking at habits and understanding them and then trying to disrupt them, we've got to look at it like that. And much of my work focuses in on how do people in perceived positions of power invite people to speak up in a way that they feel safe to do so. So that's one thing that I would say around, you know, how do habits come into place? Well, they come into place socially and relationally, and they stay in place socially and, and relationally as, as well. The other reason why we build and develop the habits that we do and why those habits stay or get disrupted is to do with power and the way that we construct status and authority in our systems. So we apply titles and labels to ourselves and to others around things like gender and age and uh, ethnicity and organization, department, location, tenure, you name it, we add a label to it. And those labels construct ideas of status, depending on the system and the context that we're in. 
And those in turn define whether we feel that we're expected to speak up, whether we should speak up, whether if we speak up, we're likely to be heard. They define when we look at other people, they define for us, you know, is this person worth listening to? So another reason why the habits that I look at come about and stay in place are because of the way that we construct power. And of course, that goes right the way back to childhood and different cultures define what we might call power distance differently. You know, do you grow up with an expectation that you will challenge authority? Or do you grow up in a context that says, no, 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 that is disrespectful. You do not question those who are in positions of authority. So we learn very early on ideas around status and authority that go on to influence us right the way through our lives. And one of the biggest mistakes, again, that we make when we're looking at culture and changing habits in the area of speaking up and psychological safety is we assume that we can do that without talking about power, which is utterly ridiculous. Impossible. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I wonder if you have done any research, because it's interesting, you know, sometimes when you think about nationalities and national cultures and how they might play into it, I feel, for example, and well, there is evidence to prove it, that the Dutch are very innovative as a nation. And when you look at the national culture, actually the power distance in the Netherlands is very low. So it means that it's quite a democratic society. It's expected, not accepted only, that people will speak up and challenge. They're very straightforward. And I wonder whether you think that it might drive the fact that it's a country where a lot of innovation happens and it seems like the Dutch always come up with amazing ideas and are able to execute on these ideas really well. Are you aware of any studies around that? And do you think that there is some relationship there between speaking up and speaking truth to power and the ability of nations and organizations to be innovative. Certainly, there's a link between conversational habits and innovation and agility. And that has been one of the biggest reasons why organizations have asked me in is because part of their strategy is to be innovative. But in order to be innovative, of course, you have to have the capacity for people to stick up their hands and offer ideas. And even more interestingly, the capacity for people to stick up their hands and go, I disagree. I wouldn't do it like that. I'd do it like this. And when you have norms in a, an organization or a team which allow that to happen, of course, your chances of innovation increase. I hesitate before drawing firm generalizations around any of these labels, because there are so many labels that combine in a particular situation. So having done lots of work, I've done quite a bit of work actually in Europe, in Netherlands and in Scandinavia. And there is certainly a country culture. But then when you go into an organization, there's an organizational culture, there's a culture in that particular team also, not to mention all of the other labels that are relevant and just as important in those countries as they are in many others. And that, you know, things like specialism, education, you know, in the UK, accent, uh, all of these things come into play and they mess everything up and mean that it becomes very difficult to generalize. And Interestingly, the work, the research that I've been doing with John Higgins over the last eight years, we've surveyed over 13,000 employees globally, but we've talked to thousands more. And even though country cultures are important and they are relevant to look at, what we found so far is that wherever you are, there are some key patterns that are inescapable and they go across all sorts of different cultures. I'm sure we'll, we'll get onto some of those patterns. Yeah, definitely. I would love to. But I want to unpack a little bit this conversation around innovation and the reason why organizations will reach out to you or to me. I think one of the things that happens a lot is we hear those really well-intentioned appeals that leaders make to their employees to speak up, to bring 
fresh ideas, to challenge the status quo and bring their whole selves to work, et cetera, et cetera. And then I think we hear the same leaders who make these appeals despair that people do not speak up for some reason. And I think it goes back to your point about this being relational and how important it is to really be aware of the dynamics that exist in these relationships and obviously also power. And I know also that you've talked to the people who don't speak up in organizations. And so you have actually information from firsthand. Why don't people speak up? What are the factors? What, what are the barriers that uh, make someone who has a lot of ideas not to share them with their colleagues or who sees a mistake and decides to keep it to themselves rather than raising a red flag? So we have asked, yes, many thousands of people that question. We developed a framework called the Truth Framework, which picks out five issues that are really relevant in our choices about whether we speak up or stay silent. And they're also really relevant in our choice about whether we listen to somebody or not. So a brief answer to your question. The first T stands for trust. So if I'm going to speak up, I have to trust in the value of my own opinion. And in our work in particular, we found that uh, people like to feel they have evidence for what they want to say. Uh, And some organizations have a very high bar around evidence and some a much lower bar, actually. But trust is about thinking, okay, I know what I'm talking about and it matters enough for me to speak up about it, because we can't speak up about everything. So trust is all about the kind of equation between those two. Have I got evidence and and is it a battle I want to take on? R stands for risk. So this is a big one. Uh, One of the reasons why I don't speak up is because I'm worried about the consequences of it. And we know people are particularly worried about upsetting the other person or being perceived negatively as a result of speaking up. Because we're social beings, we like to belong, we like to be accepted. And if we think speaking up is going to uh, endanger that, then we'll stay silent. But the other big risk, actually, that I'm quite interested in at the moment is the risk that nothing will happen, the risk of being ignored. And that seems to be just getting bigger and bigger in some of the organizations I'm I'm working with. So people just think, no, there's just no point. So that's risk. U stands for understanding, and that's around politics, because speaking up is a political act. And it helps to have some level of astuteness politically to understand, if I speak up about this, how is it going to affect other people's agendas? How is it going to affect particularly people in power? And that enables you to sort of speak up slightly more coherently. T, I've already spoken about, the second T in the truth framework is titles and labels. So the way we construct power, and if I feel I have sort of low status labels, I am likely to expect more negative consequences as a result of speaking up. If I feel less powerful, I am generally less likely to feel okay about speaking up. And then H at the end of the truth framework is on how to. So I may want to speak up. I may have thought about it quite a lot. But if I don't know how to, if I don't know who to speak to or when, or if I don't have an opportunity or a forum in which to speak up, then I will stay silent. So that's a really quick rattle through five very important. It's not complete, but they are five aspects that really affect whether and how we speak up. I love it. It's so helpful. And I love the fact that it's an acronym and we're going to put it in the show notes for our listeners to refer to it and further resources from your work. It's such a great framework. And I think there are so many reasons why people won't speak up that are linked to these five factors that fall underneath each of these letters. I'm sure that there are many different layers there. And so it has to do with people's perception. It has to do with people's understanding. It has to do with people's skills. 
in your conversation with Brene Brown, which was such a great interview, by the way, congrats. I heard her say, and it kind of stuck with me, and I think it's related to what you have just shared, that it's not only, though, the issue of making, as we sometimes say, the voiceless be heard, because first of all, there is no such thing as a voiceless person. Everyone has a voice. But making sure that the earless leaders (laughs) grow ears and they start listening. Absolutely. And I'm wondering, you know, even if someone has trust in the value of their opinion in the sense that they know that what they have to share is important, how the fact that they, they've had repeated experiences of being ignored, which is the risk, I think, that you talked about, that I might say something, but no one will actually take it into consideration. How big a barrier is that? I imagine it must be a huge barrier, so maybe it's a, really a rhetorical question. The question that I'm sure that our listeners would be interested in hearing your answer to is how do you make these earless leaders grow some ears and start listening? So that's where most of my work is. So just to to go back to how we, we began the conversation, actually, speaking up is relational. So we can do stuff ourselves in terms of making it more likely that we speak up effectively and we can seek to change our habits on that. But ultimately, whether we speak up depends on whether we feel like we're going to be heard and the the environment that we're in. And I tell this story now in pretty much all the time, because I think it's such a good metaphor for this, in an interview with a guy called Ian Wilkie, who is the founder of an organization called 50 Million Voices. And 50 Million Voices works with the community of about 50 million adults over the globe of working age that stammer. And Ian said to me in our interview, he said, how you show up, Megan, affects my voice. It affects whether I can speak. Literally, actually. If you show up frustrated or busy or judgmental, I'll lose my voice. And that is what our leaders do. You know, our leaders show up in a certain way and they either help people to find their voice or they take it away. You're right. It's The question becomes more than how do we help them speak up? It becomes how do people in positions of perceived power, how can they invite people to speak up safely? In particular, how can they invite others to disagree with them, to challenge them? I mean, offering ideas is one thing. But, you know, how can you get people to ultimately disagree with you? And that is a fairly new, I would say, leadership practice and one that I'm fascinated by. How you do it, I should think we'll have a a longer conversation on this. The first thing is how do you help those in positions of power become aware of the impact that their power has on others? And most of them Of course, they realize it when they pause enough to think about it. But most leaders and managers I work with day to day in the moment, they're fairly oblivious about how scary they are to other people. I know. And if you're not even aware of that, then you're unlikely to do the work that helps that person to feel at ease. Exactly. I experience this with companies that we work with as well. And frankly, sometimes it's shocking to me because in my interactions with the CEO, with the leadership team, these people come across as very friendly and open-minded and willing to listen. And then we run a survey and interviews and analyze the data. And often, not always, of course, what transpires is that people talk about not feeling comfortable expressing their opinions always. Uh, for fear of being labeled as negative or someone who's always bringing concerns rather than solutions and, and so on and so forth, or simply because they don't feel comfortable expressing their opinions. And I have to say that I'm not surprised that these leaders sometimes are not aware because they genuinely do come across in many interactions as very friendly and very open. And I think at least for some of them, definitely not for all of them, the feedback that they have had during their career was that 
they are so wonderful and open and collaborative. And so I think sometimes it can be hard to get to that point where you uncover that blind spot and become aware of how scary you can be to some of the people in your organization. And I genuinely ask this from a place of curiosity because I don't have an answer to that. How can you help people discover that earlier rather than later? Because I think sometimes, you know, when you get to the point where you feel like your culture has an issue and you hire a culture consultant and you do a culture assessment, it's often too late or, well, it's never too late, but it's often too late that it could have been if you were able to be aware of the impact that you have. So let's talk a bit about first, how can you build that awareness as a leader? <laughs> That's such a good question. On the one side, and when I look at my mindfulness work, I can pretty confidently say to you that you can train it. You can train somebody to be far more aware in the moment of relating around the impact that they have on others, the signals that they're sending, some of the assumptions and biases that they hold in their mind. You can train far greater awareness. The other thing is an awareness that comes through understanding something that we call the superiority illusion. Well, we don't call it. That is a, a sort of standard term for it. But it's the name for a situation where you tend to rate yourself on listening skills highly because you're rating yourself on your intent. Yes. And you're rating other people on their behavior. And there's obviously a gap. So <laughs> all of us suffer from this. But we think to ourselves, well, yes, of course I listen because I really genuinely want to listen. And yes, of course I'm lovely and approachable. Of course I am. And yet, of course, that discounts the signals that you're actually sending that you may be unaware of. It also discounts the labels that convey status and authority that I was talking to you about before and the impact that they have. So there is an, another term that we use quite a lot is called the optimism bubble. And this is where people in positions of power tend to overestimate the degree to which people are speaking up around them. And they overestimate their approachability, their listening skills, and therefore they underestimate the challenges that people around them have. And that optimism bubble is one of the first things that you need to really get people to become aware of. And most of them, you know, I explain it, I use data to explain it as well, that really has an impact. But people get it straight away. They kind of go, oh, yes, no, absolutely. Yes, I, I see it. But day to day, people just don't seem to have the space or the spaciousness to remember this, you know, and I think this leads on to a much bigger, wider, almost philosophical conversation, which I'm really interested in right now that says, you know, we are squeezing spaces out of our organizations, reflective spaces, spaces for difference. And that is beginning to have a huge impact on the way that we can speak and listen to one another. At one stage, you can train awareness. At another stage, you can show data and you can highlight it and people recognize it. At a third stage, you need people to have the space in which to remember this stuff day to day. And most of the organizations I work at are pathologically busy. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that remote and hybrid makes it even worse in terms of those spaces shrinking even further in that new model? So that is the general story that's out there, is that, you know, online working, virtual working means that we're even less likely to encounter one another as human beings. I am uh, appropriately skeptical of that story because I have been in superb, superbly relational online spaces and I have been in atrociously dysfunctional face-to-face -face meetings as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think we all have. Yeah. And I think some of the habits that we have online are 
very easy to slip into and do mean that we're reducing those sorts of relational moments. And they perhaps can be easier face to face when there's there's more informal spaces. But as I said, it's a lot more complex than one is good and one is bad. I think there are some general conditions that mean whether you're online or face to face, you're likely to meet well relationally. And there's some conditions that mean that online or face to face, you're unlikely to as well. Yeah. So if leaders do have that space to reflect and be conscious and aware of the fact that because of the formal power they carry, if not other reasons, they might come across as scarier than other colleagues and therefore they need to make more effort to create the space for others to speak up. What are other practical things that people can do? Because I'm sure that a lot of people are listening to this and wondering what are the practical things and that, that leaders can do or we can do for our leaders in our organizations to enable them to create those spaces and be this person who holds the space for others to speak up, challenge them, speak truth to power and all that good stuff that they say they want to. And yet <laughs> they somehow don't get from others because, as you say, it's relational. So I can answer that question in a couple of ways. I can answer it very pragmatically at the individual leader level. So, for example, in the truth framework, in the how to right at the end, the H for how to, we've looked at that from a listening up perspective. So how do you listen up well? And a framework, again, the five W's framework, which is who, why, where, what and when. Uh, so whose voice do you need to hear? Why? What verbal and body language are you sending that either helps people to speak up or closes them down? And where and when do you ask people to speak up? One of our, our first articles in Harvard Business Review was called The Problem with Saying My Door is Always Open. And there is this thing about leaders saying, okay, if you've got something to say, come and find me. My door is always open. Obviously, that just misses the anything to do with kind of how intimidating it may feel to go on to somebody's territory. So how do you as a leader get out there, reduce some of these power differences and get on somebody else's territory in a way that makes them feel comfortable, not the other way around? There's some individual stuff that answers how can we help people to speak up. But then there's a more macro, there's a bigger picture systemic kind of answer to that as well. And let me just use an example that's really present for me at the moment. I am seeing so many organizations talking about psychological safety, and it's a veneer, what I call a veneer. It's a this is the latest topic. Let's let's do something because it's really popular. Mm -hmm. Let's roll out some conferences and some workshops on psychological safety. And they're doing this and they're telling their leaders to listen up well and that the, the organization is being told to speak up and being told that it's a real emphasis. And all the while on the board or in the executive team, there's one or two individuals who are so far away from role modeling this sort of behavior, it's unbelievable. But they're kept there because they bring in lots of money. And so my other kind of more system-wide answer to how do we do this is it's a face up to the fact that this is much more difficult than you think, changing habits. And if you're asking people to behave in a certain way, but you are acting in ways that show that you're really not taking this to heart, then you can expect the rest of the organization to be pretty cynical about it. Absolutely. I've hardly worked with any organizations that don't smile at this point and look up to their executive team, nod their head and go, yep, we've got one of them. Absolutely. And speaking of the systemic view of this, I also noticed, I don't know if you see this in your work, that Yes, of course, this happens at a very senior level and every organization has a person or two 
that stand in the way of really demonstrating that this is important stuff for us. And yet the organization doesn't get rid of them. And then sometimes, and this is very ironic to me, what happens also in organizations that call themselves people first and they genuinely mean it. And the way it is interpreted is that we need to be nice to each other. And so people do a lot of really hard work to harmonize and make sure that we don't displease someone. And so often really hard performance conversations don't take place. And, you know, instead of giving someone feedback, you'll just clean the mess yourself, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not just happening at a senior leadership level, it's happening everywhere. When you really zoom into this and start asking questions, why is this happening? You quickly realize that actually these behaviors are being rewarded. And so there's this conversation and very often people will get promoted for going the extra mile, you know, and being the hero and saving the day because someone else messed up instead of, for example, sitting down with a team member and helping them grow and showing them how they can become better and setting them up for the long term. And I don't know if you see the same thing happening in organizations that you work with, but this is something that I find particularly ironic and hard to tackle because it's such an integral part of those organizations' identity and something that they're genuinely proud of. So a couple of things in there. Yes, I, the word I'm interested in is dialogue and how that is used and seen and understood. You'll get quite a few organizations saying that they are in dialogue or having dialogue about certain issues. And the word has connotations of, you know, you can imagine somebody sat down with a nice cup of tea with somebody else and they're having a conversation and that's a dialogue. Well, far from it, actually. Dialogue in the way that I understand it is really tough and difficult and full of disagreement. And it has fallout and people make mistakes. And it's not smooth and it's not, you know, harmonious like that. Or pleasant. Yeah. Or necessarily pleasant. So how do we how do we enable that sort of dialogue a little bit more? And one of the problems is that again, when you look at leadership teams, there aren't that many leadership teams that role model disagreement really well. I've come across leadership teams that either try and portray utter consensus to the rest of the organization, or it's really obvious that they disagree and they're doing it really dysfunctionally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's totally autocratic. Yeah. Yeah. And there aren't <laughs> so many that give signals to the rest of the organization that it's okay to disagree, that it's okay that you can be respectful and do that. And that that's at the heart of dialogue and that if there isn't any challenge and disagreement, then it isn't dialogue. It's harmonious agreement, which has its place if it's genuine, but isn't likely to be the seat of innovation. That, I think, is a term that, that is misused, as is psychological safety. That has connotations of being nice and warm and cozy and cuddly and safe. Yeah. And as Amy Edmondson will say in all of her work, nah, -uh, you know, no, psychological exactly. safety means saying the tough stuff and, and it being okay to challenge and to disagree. Exactly. And if you don't have that safety, then it's, again, going to have quite a lot of impact on the rest of your organization. But the, the thing as well that you mentioned about the behavior, the behavior does send real signals into the rest of the organization about what's really matters, you know, what's really rewarded around here. And you cannot go on and on about how it, I, I work, I've worked with a team recently on collaboration. You know, they're really trying to improve rates of collaboration across the organization and in the executive team. And there's a couple of individuals in this team that are not interested at all in collaborating with anybody else. And they're kept on because they bring most of the money in. They are the profit centers, you know, a and it calls for a really straight conversation. And I have had a straight conversation with them that says, you know, will you please stop spending so much money on trying to get everybody to collaborate whilst you're still 
promoting that sort of behavior. It's a complete waste of time. You need to make some hard choices here. Really, and they are hard. You know, I'm, I'm not underestimating how hard it is for an organization that's struggling to get rid of, potentially, somebody that's uh, in inverted commas, high performer because they're bringing in a lot of profit. This is not an easy decision and choice, uh, but it is one that you have to face into. Yeah, absolutely. And I think on the other side of the spectrum, in some organizations also saying goodbye to some of the people who are not delivering at the level that is expected, if they have been guided through the whole process of improving their performance and still don't deliver because again, the message there is that it's acceptable. And so people will end up harmonizing because if you can't get rid of them, then at least, you know, you have to get along. And, and so that leads to dysfunction as well. Okay. Well, I wish we could speak longer about this. I know that we're slowly running out of time. So I would like us to shift gears a little bit and move to a question that we have from our listeners. And this time, so it happens that the listener is a part of my company, the culture brain, Anish, and this is the question that he has for you. Hi, Megan. This is Anish El Nabarawi, and here's my question for you. In one of our client organizations, employees raise a concern around taking on clients who are not aligned with their company's values. The concern there was predominantly around working with these companies who haven't entirely cut their ties with Russia after invading Ukraine. So how do you respond to something like that, especially as a leader when your board is adamant that you cannot turn clients down for reasons that are considered political? It is a tough one, but it is one that we've been researching for the last couple of years. <laughs> so John and I have been looking at employee activism. And we know that we are in an age where employees are more willing to speak up about wider social and environmental issues than ever before. And we also know that this calls for an interesting challenge in terms of leadership practice. So to hone in a little bit on that question, it isn't possible, like perhaps it was in the past, to say we're apolitical. We're not going to get involved in this particular area because we're going to focus on the business stuff. Companies tried that and it didn't go so well. Base camp and so on. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And still try and still try and state that. It's not so we say in our research, you know, it's as risky really to stay on the activism fence as it is to get off it. In other words, it's as risky if you don't do anything as if you you know you do and this doesn't mean that leaders therefore have to take a stand on everything because of course they can't but they do need to figure out with their stakeholders what they are going to make a stand on and how that's going to actually work so that's the thing that's critical here is how do they understand what's important to their employees to their customers to their shareholders, to their investors, to their suppliers? Are they aware of areas of concern? And then how do they make the choices collectively, given the fact that people will have differing opinions, on where to draw these lines? Yeah. And then, of course, you've got to keep talking about it. Because in that case, you can have a leadership team that says, no, no, no you can't draw a line based on Russia. You've got an employee saying, hang on a second. So where's the dialogue? Back to what we were talking about before. Where are the forums? Where are the places where people can inquire together and listen to one another and keep some of these conversations alive? Because of course, a leadership team can make some choices along with its stakeholders but we're in a world that changes, you know, changes radically sometimes every day. So these decisions and choices have to stay fluid and in dialogue. I love this point that you've made about what are the areas of concern, because I think sometimes we focus on values and it's not as informative as trying to focus on what are the areas of concerns for our stakeholders right now? What are the important issues and how can we address these issues? 
So thank you for that. And I also know, so on behalf of our listeners, having heard this answer, have you seen any effective ways of creating these spaces of dialogue and forums to discuss issues like this? What works for other companies that are doing it well? Have you seen any examples of companies that do it well? So again, I'm going to answer that in two different ways. So the pragmatic answer is, Yes, absolutely. I'm seeing organizations with employee resource groups uh, and networks that are, you know, have brilliant conversations and draw together the concerns of employees to feed up and influence organizations. I've come across uh, leadership teams that are genuinely good at getting out there and listening to employees. I uh, recently interviewed somebody from a retailer who said, you cannot delegate your listening responsibility to pulse surveys. Oh my God. Can you please say that again so that people really hear it? (laughs) You cannot delegate your listening responsibility to pulse surveys. And I I mean, I thought that was a great thing to say. Yes. So I do see companies where leaders do genuinely get stuck in. They get out there and they are listening. I've seen organizations draw together groups of representatives that are there on call when something happens. So we've had a string of quite sudden announcements or things that have happened in society and in the environment that have called for fairly swift organizational responses. And so uh, I think some organizations now are able to draw quite quickly on stakeholder opinions to guide responses rather than sort of shooting from the hip, which is what was happening previously. So there are ways of making sure that you're listening and responding. But the second way I'd answer that question is all of these forums and shadow boards and reverse mentoring and employee network, they're all, again, you know, all complete waste of time if there isn't a really a genuine interest and curiosity from the people in positions of power. And I've seen that range quite dramatically. You know, I've seen organizations that are as slick as anything. Uh, One organization I'm thinking of at the moment, a global organization that's sort of in the press for having quite slick processes on dialogue and employee activism. I've spoken to one of their senior leaders confidentially who said, yeah, no, it, I mean, it doesn't make any difference at all. Nobody's actually listening. Do we have leaders that know that their perspective is partial? Do we have leaders that know that they have big blind spots, especially on these wider social and environmental issues? Do we have leaders that are fascinated at finding out what their blind spots are? That's leadership practice to me increasingly. And uh, it's a real shift. It is. And oh my God, what wonderful questions. I think it's a safe assumption for any leader to answer these questions with, yeah, I do have blind spots. And yeah, uh, my perspective is just my perspective and it's going to be different from others. And yes, I absolutely need to find out what other people's perspective is because I think it's it's pretty obvious that we all do have our biases and our perspectives and they don't align with perspectives of our colleagues at work. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully this is going to gradually change and more and more leaders are going to assume that they are not an exception to this role. And if I can just say one more thing, because I've spoken about the sort of leadership response to activism, our research also looks at the activist. So it looks at the employee that wants to speak up and say, hang on a second, this doesn't feel right. And there are, again, numerous ways of trying to reduce the risk of speaking up in that way. We, we, we borrow a term from Mayerson and Scully, which is called tempered radical. I think I may have mentioned this in the Brené Brown podcast. When we are seeking change in an organization, we need to be radical in order to make a change. But if we're too radical, we get spat out of the system. Yeah, we alienate people. Yeah. So we have to temper. We temper how radical we are. But if we temper it too much, of course, we don't make any difference at all. Productive activism, I suppose, 
is that very tricky navigation between being too radical or not radical enough. And sometimes when you're not as a lone voice, you can collectively voice that significantly helps. And so a lot of, again, a lot of our studies into activism look at how you can reduce the risk and increase the impact and be radical, but not so radical that the system can't even hear you. I love this. So let's shift gears once more. The final section of the show is uh, the rapid fire questions. I'm going to ask you five questions in rapid succession. And the challenge here for you, Megan, is to answer all of them in under two minutes. Great. Shall we try? That had lots of sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go for it. How do you define organizational culture? Well, the lens on organizational culture that I have is to do with conversational habits. So one definition of culture is what gets said and who gets heard. And another one, an extra one, is how does power get exercised? What are the signs that a company culture needs some work or perhaps even a major overhaul? One of the signs is that there is silence on an issue that matters. What are the companies, or at least one, that you admire for the culture? If there is one, then why? Do you know what? I never hold a company up as a best practice one. We don't tend to refer to examples of anybody that's got it right. For the pure fact that we haven't found anybody, it's <laughs> usually, uh, if, if somebody thinks that culture is right, it's usually because they come at it from a particular perspective. Mm -hmm. There'll always be other perspectives that don't agree. And positive, in inverted commas, positive cultures that we've explored have always had a shadow side. They've also been incredibly fragile. So you put up a company and say, this company's got it right. And, and my goodness, they can lose it very, very quickly. So although I've seen aspects of companies that I admire, I would not really hold one up without at least half an hour to describe why I've held them up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. So are there any books on philosophy, culture, leadership that you would recommend to our listeners? loads. I've always loved Nancy Klein's work, The Promise That Changes Everything, Time to Think. I obviously admire Amy Edmondson's work and fearless uh, organizations. Just to chuck a couple of left fielders in Ian McGilchrist's work on the master and, and his emissary. Oh my gosh, we had someone else mention this book. It's, ah, such a, right. it's a rare book, but it was, yeah, yeah, it was Patsy Rodenberg a voice coach <laughs> who recommended that book. Yeah, thank you for that. He's not written it as a leadership book, but my goodness, is it a leadership book in terms of how uh, the impact that uh, that right and left hemisphere has. And I'd, you know, very even more left field as my uh, part of my PhD, I studied the work of Martin Buber, who is a philosopher who looked at relationships and how we encounter one another. And his work is rather, you know, very poetic. Uh, but again, has some deep implications for leadership and the way we relate in organizations. Wonderful. So finally, what is one thing that our listeners can do literally tomorrow to build their own culture lab and start cultivating the sort of culture that is going to help them and their teams to bring their vision to life? So I would say, figure out what needs to be talked about but isn't being talked about at the moment and start talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, sorry, if I may so slightly tap this on as well, and respond well when <laughs> others and if others start bringing up these important issues. So, you know, start speaking about the stuff that matters and start listening in a way that means that people will continue to speak up about it. I love it. Megan, thank you so much for this conversation. I wish we had more time. I had so many more questions to, to ask you. Really grateful for you making the time to jump on this call with me and have this chat. If people want to learn more about your work, what are the best online places that they should visit? So I have a website, which is meganrates.com. 
and that has pretty much all of the the resources that you'd like. I've got a couple of TED TEDx talks in this remit, particularly one that's just come out on employee activism that people might want to tune into. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Aga Bayer, the creator and host of the Culture Lab podcast, and this is the Culture Lab team. Anis and Labarawi, production manager. Sound producer, Heather McPherson, Twisted Spur Media. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Culture Lab podcast. Megan Braids and I hope that you got inspired by what she shared about speaking up and employee activism. If you'd like an opportunity to interact with Professor Megan Braids and other guests of the Culture Lab podcast, you might consider joining the Culture Brain community. Culture Brain is one of a kind global community for culture leaders who look for new ways of cultivating remarkable cultures in this brave new world of remote and hybrid work. If you are in charge of a culture shaping project, and if you believe that work should be synonymous with fun, meaning and belonging, well, I think that you'd feel right at home in our community. It's a really diverse group of culture leaders from Fortune 100 to tiny startups on a rapid growth trajectory. And what brings us together is a passion, a passion for cultivating a healthy culture at scale. We are guided by our values of being bold, being kind and being curious. And we'd love for you to join if it feels like the right fit for you. You can learn more at tinyurl.com forward slash culture brains. You'll find the link in the show notes. And now it's time for the preview of our next episode. And this time I have the pleasure to bring my friend Jeanette Bronet to the show for the second time. Jeanette has a new book coming out. It's called The Self-Care Mindset. And oh my gosh, it's such a great read. In this episode, we will talk about the tools that you can use to maximize your work-life quality so that you can better navigate the new world that we live in. Here is a short preview of our conversation. The thing that really is shifting, I think, is when we talk about a well-being culture, we've sort of looked at it as giving people more well-being support, well-being programs and things like that. And I think those things are essential, but that it doesn't stop there. That's not a well-being culture. That's a culture where people have access to the things they need, yes. But a well-being culture is really built on human relationships. Culture is about human relationships, which comes down to our conversations. Thanks for tuning in and listening to this episode of the Culture Lab podcast. If you found any moments that were interesting, inspiring, or maybe even game-changing, please share this episode with someone who'd appreciate it. After all, good ideas are meant to be shared. If you haven't subscribed to the Culture Lab yet, you can do it on any podcast streaming platform of your choice. If you want to receive our weekly insights on cultivating a remarkable, powerful, and authentic company culture, especially in a business that scales, type this into your browser. tinyurl.com forward slash agabayer. That's T-I-N-Y-U-R-L dot com forward slash A-G-A-B-A-J-E-R. Also, we would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review our podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to it. And finally, the entire Culture Lab team and our guests, we are going to continue exploring how we can make the word work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging, and how we can build remarkable cultures that scale as our businesses grow and the world keeps on changing. So, what do you want to hear about next? What matters to you? Email us at lindsay at and let us know.